Um, by now, just about everything's been said about humility at this wonderful conference, though not everyone has said it yet. Uh, and the one angle new I can bring is that uh, I'm ad addressing something that I've studied, which is the history of American evangelicalism and thinking about humility as an issue for American evangelicals. And that's because evangelicals are not particularly known for their humility, even though they often talk about it as an important Christian virtue. Uh, and evangelicals often are thought to be arrogant. Now, sometimes that's just unfair because uh, evangelicals are said to be arrogant because they're so dogmatic about what they believe. But in fact, there's lots of people who uh, profess to be relativists who are very dogmatic about the relativism and just about, you know, that's, being dogmatic is not an unusual among human traits. But evangelicals are, I think, particularly conspicuous in their uh, assertiveness uh, and in saying that they have everything right and everybody else has everything wrong. And that's understandable, I think. I mean, they, they are evangelicals after all, and that means that not only do they see their views as founded on the solid rock of God's word, but both lay people as well as pastors see it as their duty and the kindest thing you can do for your neighbor to share that truth with, with other people. So they tend to be assertive about what they believe because they, they believe that eternity uh, rests in the balance. So part of the problem is, is simply the inevitable offense of the cross that's involved in proclaiming Christianity and that we're told is going to be foolishness to, to the Gentiles. And so uh, evangelicals will, will not be seen as particularly humble people. Uh, but whatever the inevitable offense that there might be in these traits of evangelicalism, they're accentuated by uh, some other conspicuous traits. Uh, modern evangelicalism differs from uh, a, uh, most sorts of Christianity in that it's structured as a set of competitive free enterprise religious movements. And that encourages enterprising entrepreneurs. And one benefit of that is it encourages competition and encourages growth, but it also encourages competitive entrepreneurs and competitive brand name denominations uh, that succeed in part by combining the gospel message, uh, or at least aspects of it, with a good bit of self-promotion. Now self-promotion, again, is uh, a necessary uh, trait in any public enterprise, and uh, anyone, preachers need to be bold, you can't really preach the gospel of maybe. Uh, <laughs> but uh, evangelical competitive free enterprise system uh, can also encourage spiritual pride. And often it happens that leaders or groups proclaim that their particular views are the only truly orthodox ones and they emphasize uh, their emphases or distinctive teachings in a way that encourages dogmatic loyalties uh, that really go beyond uh, the gospel itself. So recognizing that evangelical Christians face the challenge of trying to be sufficiently humble, uh, I propose to enlist the insights of two of the most trusted mentors of the movement, C.S. Lewis and, and Jonathan Edwards. And uh, as you heard, I, I've worked on both of these in the last couple of years, I've been uh, talking about them together. And I find that, that even though they, they sound as though it would be a hard match. They, they, they really are, are great complementary in, in having insights on most uh, topics. Uh, that uh, Lewis is a uh, 
theological minimalist who often has very precise insights on things, whereas Edwards is a maximalist who uh, provides exhaustive analysis of, of things and, and uh, can uh, bring out uh, elements that you, wouldn't, uh, you might not see otherwise. And uh, I think it's, uh, what one finds is that they're complementary, and the reason for that is they're both working in the grand Christian tradition. And so uh, I was saying to, to Jennifer Hurt that uh, I, I, I could make it this uh, Edwards, uh, Lewis, and Thomas Aquinas, and it would, would work well because there's a harmony there if you, and you could add Luther from last night. They're all working in the same tradition and, and the essence of what they say is going to uh, therefore uh, harmonize. Lewis provides a great uh, starting point uh, for talking about issues of pride and, and humility as uh, central to the Christian experience. Uh, in Mere Christianity, Lewis organizes his uh, chapters on Christian behavior uh, around the virtues. And uh, it's his chapter on pride that uh, has been one of the most effective in uh, helping people uh, get to the essence of, of why one might need to be a Christian. A number of famous conversions have been a result of reading that chapter. Uh, he calls the chapter The Great Sin, and uh, so he, even though he's talking about the virtues, in this chapter uh, he talks about uh, humility largely by talking about the great sin of pride. Uh, as the opposite of uh, humility. Uh, and uh, he says that uh, this is the central vice that Christianity addresses, and the centrality of pride and humility is where Christian morals differ most sharp sharply uh, from other morals. So, so pride and humility is uh, very centrally a Christian uh, interest. Uh, in uh, the Christian tradition, following Augustine, uh, Lewis explains in, in his uh, The Problem of Pride uh, that pride is a sin that accounts for the fall of the human race. Pride is a phenomenon uh, whereby a creature that is essentially a, a, de a dependent being whose principle of existence lies not in itself but in another tries to set up on his own. So, so humans whose very existence is, uh, and very abil every ability is a gift of, of the creator, uh, rebel against that dependence on the creator and think of themselves as independent uh, authorities or the highest uh, authority. And so they succumb to the sin of self-idolatry. They come to worship uh, themselves really rather than God. The, the, the self is the, the cent at the center of things that they bow down to. So ever since the fall of the race, uh, the, since the fall of the race has been spoiled by this tendency. So we all put ourselves at the center of existence. And Lewis says we see this in, even in little children, see it in rich people, we see it in poor people, uh, we see it in uh, loving relationships uh, that, that are ruined. Uh, we see it uh, each new uh, day when uh, pious people pray that everything may be put in God's hands and before we know it, uh, we're organizing the day for our own pleasure and our own benefit. So pride, as Lewis explains it in, in Mere Christianity, is essentially competitive. Uh, and, and I think this is a, I find this a very helpful insight uh, having self-satisfaction as our ideal, we search for ways to see ourselves as better than others. And some others have, in, in this conference have pointed out the same uh, thing. So Lewis says this, we say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking uh, than others. So uh, without the competitive quality, there is no pride. And so he says, Christians are right to claim 
It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Other vices, he says, like drunkenness or unchastity might bring people together. <laughs> Those are the good vices. Uh, <laughs> but pride always means en enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between humans and humans, but enmity uh, to God. Lewis recognizes that, that some people who claim to be very religious are uh, quite obviously very, also very proud. He, he explains that, uh, that he, he thinks that that means that they are worshiping a God of their own devising. They think, they think they're humbling themselves before this phantom deity, and so they see themselves as much more righteous than, than other people. Uh, these are the sort of people that Lewis says, uh, of whom Christ was thinking when he said that some would preach about him and cast out devils in, in his name only to be told at the end of the world that he had never known them. Uh, luckily, Lewis adds, we have a test. Whenever we think uh, that our religious life makes us better than anyone else, we can be sure that it was not the work of God, but of the devil. Now, Lewis in this chapter in Mere Christianity says, uh, very little directly about humility, since he talks so much about pride, and it was for a 12-minute radio broadcast, after all. Uh, it's amazing how much he could get into, uh, in, into a short time. Uh, but rather than thinking, well, one aspect of humility he does mention is it is thinking of ourselves in a non-competitive sort of way that uh, we are thinking uh, in, in the interest of other people. Truly humble people, he observes, will not be thinking about humility because they will not really be thinking that much about themselves. Lewis says a lot more about humility in the screw tape letters, as you might recall. And uh, so in one of the screw tape uh, letters, the senior devil uh, writes to, to his protege, Wormwood, uh, regarding Wormwood's patient, the, the young man who's in danger of becoming a Christian. And uh, he writes, uh, Screwtype writes with alarm, your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? <laughs> Catch him, uh, Screwtype suggests, at a moment when he's especially poor in spirit and then remind him of how humble he has become. He then may well become proud of his humility. Now, Screwtape goes on to explain uh, that what the enemy that is God wants is humility. Uh, it is that our enemy wants to turn the man's attention from self to him and to the man's neighbors. Oh, one, one way to distract from true humility, Screwtape observes, is to convince him that humility is just having a low opinion of your talents and character. And, and here I might uh, add that uh, Lewis, as a philologist studying words, was very much aware of the double meanings of humility that we've been talking about. And uh, I, I think uh, it'd be helpful to make the distinction, which is implicit in Lewis, and uh, that there's Christian hu hum uh, humility as a major vice. And he always, he always capitalizes these, uh, humility and pride. And then uh, pride for the Christian is the chief Christian vice. But then there's also uh, what uh, people sometimes call proper pride, uh, which is uh, you know, ha having a, a proper view of your yourself, and then there could be something like improper humility or undesirable humility, maybe a bit better term for people who have low self-esteem. But those are really four different things. There's uh, pride as a, an essential defect in the human race and humility as the antidote to that. And then there are these character traits of uh, proper pride or uh, low self-esteem. Self Anyway, uh, he's, he's quite aware of that uh, distinction in making, uh, you know, talking about humility as the opposite of pride. So true humility, uh, he says, 
uh, it would be non-competitive, would be to achieve some great thing, uh, like uh, design a great cathedral, he says, uh, but take no more pleasure in it than the accomplishments uh, of your neighbor, or uh, no more pleasure in it than if it were a sunset or a waterfall, that what you do is, uh, is a gift just as the sunset is, is a gift. And if people truly love God and love their neighbors, they will rejoice in the good gifts that God has given to others as well as themselves. So if you're an academic, as a few people here are, you should be taking just as much pride in what your colleague accomplishes in, 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 in your field, even, and, and if they surpass you, great, that's what you're trying to, that's what you wanted, wanted, wanted to happen in the first place. So uh, humility is, uh, seeing everything you have as a gift, as well as everything anyone else does as a gift. So he says, you wouldn't take any more pride in your accomplishments than you would uh, take pride in the color of your hair. Uh, so it's essentially non-competitive. For Lewis, achieving humility is an essential outcome of evangelical conversion. If pride is a great sin of humankind, and the source of the fall, then conversion is the essential corrective. Accordingly, he describes conversion as being becoming a new person, losing uh, what we call ourselves. Out of ourselves, into Christ we must go, he writes in, in Mere Christianity. So for Lewis, true Christian humility is that attitude toward uh, oneself that results from subordinating yourself to God in Christ. And, and so if, if Christ is the center of your life, or if God is the center of your reality rather than self, then you see yourself not as the center of reality, as we all sort of automatically do, but you see yourself on the periphery along with everyone else, and that allows you to be non-competitive, allows you to be charitable, allows, allows you to uh, treat others as, as though they're as important as you are. At least you can uh, work on, on that. Uh, so uh, rather than being competitive toward others, we will approach them humbly, knowing that we have received far beyond what we deserve, and we will rejoice in the gifts uh, that others may receive. Okay, that's Lewis. My second mentor is, is, is Edwards. And uh, Edwards uh, deals with humility uh, most thoroughly in uh, his great book on religious affections. And uh, that book is not about the virtues as such, but rather it comes out of the experience that a lot of uh, Puritans had of worrying about whether or not they had evidences of being truly conver converted. And then Edwards participated in uh, the Great Awakening and in other awakenings that were associated with uh, what was the rise of evangelicalism. So he's dealing with a, a particular evangelical phenomenon that the enthusiasm of the revivals would lead a lot of people to think they were converted. But then, and, and he actually uh, wrote about uh, a lot of people he thought were converted, and then a few years later he realized uh, that had been a false conversion, and these people really had been much more in love with their own uh, experience than they were really uh, in love with God. So their self was still at the, at the center rather than God being at the center. So uh, he writes uh, religious affections to try to identify uh, all the symptoms, all the signs that you might look for, uh, for whether you or someone else might be uh, converted. And, and basic says you, you still can't tell for sure, but th this is the best uh, estimate that you can do by looking at it, and, and he's very thorough as in, in, in spelling these all out. Uh, the sixth of the signs is, is humility, and uh, for, for that, Edwards is not restrained at all in saying how important humility is. He says this, this is the great and most essential thing in true religion. And further, they that are destitute of this have no true religion. 
whatever profession they may make, or however high soever their religious affections may, may be. Uh, and in a, in a footnote, uh, Edwards quotes John Calvin, who in turn quotes Augustine, saying that if asked what was the first precepts of the Christian religion, uh, and it's a quote, uh, I would answer firstly, humility, secondly, humility, thirdly, humility, and forever, humility. Uh, so much like Lewis, Edward sees, sees true humility as essentially the giving up of the self for Christ. Uh, he sometimes uses the term evangelical humiliation, which is an old Puritan term, uh, which means something like the humility that arises from seeing how beautifully good the good news is. Uh, so it's a, a voluntary self-denial in the light of encountering the highest beauty and the highest goodness that draws you to it. You see the, the, the ultimate goodness of the sacrifice of Christ for the undeserving, and that uh, gospel uh, draws you to it and so draws you out of yourself to love something beyond uh, your, yourself. So it puts your self-love into its proper, it doesn't destroy your self-love, but it puts it in, back into its proper relationship as subordinate to love of God. Uh, so, uh, and secondly, he says, uh, hum true humility de uh, involves denying one's, uh, it says his, his natural self-exaltation and renouncing his own dignity and glory and being emptied of himself so that he does freely and from his heart as it were, renounce himself. Uh, in, in his sermon series, Charity and Its Fruits, uh, he, he also says that one characteristic of the person who is humble before God is that he will not be disposed to trust in himself. And I think uh, that, that's a good encapsulation of how different the Edwardsian and the classic Christian tradition is from the American tradition where trust yourself uh, becomes, even though and God we trust becomes the motto on the money. Uh, the real motto is, uh, is trust yourself. I saw uh, once around the 4th of July uh, a church sign that uh, read, the last four letters of American are I can. Uh, and I thought that was probably not a Edwardsian church. <laughs> Uh, Edwards is especially concerned with how the evangelical emphasis on conversion and uh, in the revivals can lead to false humility, and, and that's a continuing evangelical uh, problem. So, it, 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 he, so he's very much aware of that catch-22 that Lewis mentions also, uh, of people taking pride in how humble uh, they are, or pride in how much they have submitted to God and you haven't. Uh, so Edward says, an infallible sign of spiritual pride is persons being apt to think highly of their humility. False humility is especially likely when people's religious affections are, are very uh, much raised by, by emotion. Uh, so yeah, he, he, at one point he wrote, writes a letter of advice to a 17-year-old uh, woman uh, convert, uh, Deborah Hathaway, and he, he says this, uh, remember, that pride is the worst viper that is in the heart, the greatest disturber of the soul's peace, a sweet communion with Christ. It was the first sin committed and lies lowest in the foundation of Satan's whole building. It, it is with the greatest difficulty rooted out and it is the most hidden, secret, and deceitful of all us and often creeps insensibly into the midst of religion even sometimes under the guise of humility itself. So uh, as that suggests, it's very difficult to gauge uh, how humble one uh, is because of that, that catch-22 that if you think yourself humble, then uh, you're not really humble. Now in, in religious affections, Edwards deals with humility almost solely as subordination to, to the love of God. And he says, 
little about humility in relation to other people. But the reason for that is that religious affections is not about the virtues, and he, so he doesn't separate, doesn't make any attempt to separate out the virtues, but rather he's all the affections, all the signs of the affections are interrelated. So uh, prior to uh, talking about humility, he talks about the signs of being properly enraptured by the beauty of God, the love of God, and so forth that leads to humility. And then after talking about the sixth sign of humility, he goes on to other uh, signs, some of which are much more uh, observable. Uh, one of them, for instance, is uh, that a uh, truly converted person uh, would have a, would be attended with a lamb-like, dove-like spirit and temper of Jesus Christ. Or in other words, they naturally beget and promote such a spirit of love, meekness, meekness quietness, forgiveness and mercy as appeared in Christ. So there's all these symptoms that would, would be uh, outgrowths of humility. Some, someone, uh, uh, Everett Worthington was talking about humility as a gateway uh, virtue, and, and it's a gateway to, uh, for instance, to charity. So in religious affections, the last and longest section of the religious affection is on uh, the practice of Christian practice is the best test of whether you have Christian uh, attitudes, what you do, uh, how much uh, charity is, is, is there. Uh, so uh, that, that, that provides a, a hard practical uh, test. Okay, so um, quickly, what, what have we learned from these uh, two mentors about humility? Both of them uh, see genuine Christian humility as something like this, uh, an attitude of an appropriate regard for oneself that results from having subordinated one's self-interest to the love of God and to what God loves. So you subordinate yourself to the love of God and to what God's loves, and that gives you humble attitudes toward everything then. Uh, so for both, humility involves a radical and difficult reorientation from our natural self-centeredness. Uh, so that's why evangelical conversion is, uh, it, 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 certainly it, the, uh, for, for them it would, would, would be a, a I'm going to, I don't want to say necessary condition, but, but, but it certainly would be very helpful uh, for, for that kind of radical uh, orientation. Uh, it's, it comes from when it's, one is truly born again, an attitude of, of uh, sense of belonging, not to oneself, but as the Heidelberg Catechism puts it, and I think Luther said something like this too, uh, not to, you don't belong to yourself, but to our, our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, that's an attitude that's a lot easier described than uh, adhered to. Uh, both uh, Edwards and Lewis uh, would emphasize that humility grows out of recognizing the true nature of our humanity, that we are creatures, and everything that we have, therefore, is a purely a gift. Uh, and then as a gift, paradoxically, it's something you need to work for, but you get it as a gift, so if you take pride in getting it, uh, then that uh, can undo the gift. Uh, closely related to these attitudes of humility uh, that involves recognizing everything is, that you have as a gift is that both Lewis and Edwards remind us that religiously based pride often wears the mask of humility. And Lewis uh, is particularly alert uh, to the uh, kind of Pharisees who think that they have all the theological answers and correct practices uh, and use their religion uh, of correctness to lord it over other people. And as I said, evangelical free enterprise and encouragement of entrepreneurs uh, does encourage uh, that uh, sometimes. Uh, so uh, Lewis, I think, is particularly helpful in trying to counter uh, that idea that of, you know that we got it and, and, and nobody else does. 
particularly in mere Christianity, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Edwards is helpful on another front, and that is he's helpful for uh, self-examination as to one, whether one is truly humble in that he presents all these signs of religious affections as interrelated. So if you want to say, are you really humble, you, can, you don't need to just look at humility. You have to look at the things that are antecedent to humility, the conditions that create it, and, and the uh, things that proceed, proceed from it. Uh, so it's all interconnected. So, and, and, and particularly, I think it's helpful to, to say if you know, one test of humility is Christian practice, or uh, a test of humility is how charitable uh, are people. And charity, of course, comes in many forms of taking time with people, helping people, uh, actually giving money to people. Uh, and uh, that, that's a real test of are you truly humble? What are, what are you actually doing? And Edwards is good at bringing that out. I think, uh, I won't go into it, but in, in their biographies, uh, if you look at their biographies, both Edwards and Lewis uh, score pretty well in, in being charitable in the way they, uh, they lived. Uh, and, and so when I'm thinking about humility for evangelicals, I think uh, one, aspect of it might be to uh, think that, that, that evangelicals might, you know, if they, if they have the problem, an image problem of lacking, seem to lack humility, if they put more emphasis on charity, uh, that might uh, be, be helpful. Now, it's actually the case that it's well documented that uh, pe people who are active churchgoers in, in the United States uh, give a lot more, for instance, uh, e even to secular causes than people who don't go to church. But that's not usually the first thing that people think about uh, when they think about uh, church goers. There's a lot of charity going on, but it's not uh, very prominent uh, in, in, in the uh, culture. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that's emphasized. And it might be helpful to have an emphasis on something like uh, magnanimity if I could pronounce that word, uh, uh, th that encourages moral greatness, or th that would be the kind of moral emphasis that it would be associated with evangelicalism, rather than the moral emphases of here are the things that we are against, and uh, you know, that other people do that we don't uh, do. Uh, there could be a lot more uh, positive emphasis on what uh, Edwards calls the whole range of Christian practice or charity. Uh, so uh, the internal task, uh, so to speak, would be to cultivate in ourselves the humility that so many Christians have agreed is central to the tradition. Uh, but then the practical external emphasis would be the test of how does humility express itself in charity and what other things that we, we do, particularly charity uh, that goes beyond our own uh, immediate concerns or interests. And, and so this is a, you know, it's a great challenge to, I think, uh, everyone, but it certainly uh, it seems to me that if evangelicals were known better for their charity, uh, that would let the light of their uh, humility, and there often is true humility, shine through a lot better. Finally, uh, quickly, uh, what about intellectual humility? Let me get rid of my papers. Uh, that would be humility as it applies to our intellectual activities and beliefs, something like owning our intellectual limitations and not allowing our intellectual attainments to be sources of pride. Uh, the main thing I think you can learn from Edwards on this front uh, is that his intellectual accomplishments grow out of his heroic efforts to subordinate his thinking uh, to God's revelation. And he very much works for the sort of humility enjoined in, in biblical passages like 1 Peter 3, 8, uh, where we're told to be of a humble mind, in which Scott Haferman uh, reminded is t characteristic biblical view of humility is subordinating your mind, intellectual humility, subordinating your mind to the mind of God. Uh, 
And so Edwards did that by spending hours a day in prayer, uh, Bible study, contemplations, uh, and uh, trying to see everything through a biblical lens. At the same time uh, that he uh, made these efforts to subordinate everything to God, uh, that led to some of his stunning theological achievements. But as, as Ronald Niebuhr has reminded us, often your, your, your greatest achievements can, can lead to uh, some vices as well. And uh, for Edwards, I think it sometimes led to intellectual overreach or some things that Edwards uh, thought that he was sure he, he could predict and know uh, that, that uh, now look uh, like, like he had millennial views that thought the post-millennial view that the millennium would start in the year 2000, which pretty certainly is a, a wrong view, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, if, if Edwards is a model of intellectual humility in the sense of seeking to submit the intellect wholly to God and to God's word, Lewis is a superb model for evangelicals in practicing intellectual humility in the sense of recognizing one's intellectual limits. Lewis, of course, could be dogmatic about the essentials of the faith, but he also makes a very helpful distinction between things essential and, and things not essential on which uh, Christians uh, often disagree. And as someone who has a strong sense of history and has studied the history of Christian thought, he assumed an attitude of humility not only in learning from great Christians of the, of the past, uh, but recognizing that Christians today need not resolve all the ongoing debates from the past. Rather than relying on his own genius or the latest findings of our own time, I uh, said just rely on the Christian teachings that have really te uh, stood the test of time. So uh, I, th I think there's a very helpful uh, way of thinking about intellectual humility in terms of mere Christianity. Uh, that, and, and mere Christianity is simply, uh, he defines as the belief that uh, has been common to nearly all Christians at all times. It's, uh, so uh, he says, my religion uh, what is, uh, Christianity is, is and was uh, what it was long before I was born and whether I like it or not. Uh, so he stresses that, that this version of Christianity uh, should not replace traditional creeds or uh, forms of worship. Everyone needs a particular uh, place of worship and, and tradition to uh, develop their Christianity. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, and, and someone referred in the conference said hallway Christianity, that, you're, you know, that gets you into the hallway and then you need a particular uh, communion to develop your Christianity. But, but Lewis says very helpfully, uh, but the rule of the house ought to be uh, that uh, once people have made their choice of affiliation, that they must be kind to those who have made a different choice or, or who are still making up their minds. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, one of the aspects of the evangelical free enterprise system is that it's often so competitive, and that encourages uh, uh, spiritual pride sometimes among uh, leaders and parishioners. Uh, loyalty to a subgroup is generated because we have it right and everybody else has it wrong. So uh, today I think it would be especially helpful if evangelicals would emphasize more the idea of mere Christianity, uh, that that's more basic than their allegiance to their particular uh, group or or, uh, or sect, that it would, uh, mere Christianity signals that one is committed to the essentials of the faith, but then it also, mere Christianity emphasizes our commonality with a much wider spectrum of believers, including evangelicals who may be of a different race or different ethnicity or different nationality than we are, and also including uh, not only uh, varieties of Protestants, uh, but also Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and other kinds of Christians. Uh, so we can still talk about our differences, and, and some of which are substantial. Uh, we don't, we're not saying those are not important. Uh, 
we need to do the best we can to get things right. And that's why we have theological seminaries and Christian universities and study centers. But we need to try to get things right in the context of humility. Uh, all that we have and all that we know is a gift of God. All that we know about God is a gift of God. Uh, so we should teach and proclaim the gospel in the most adequate way that we can, but we should do it in the framework of being willing to be corrected and to learn from others. And we can learn uh, not only from the teachers and the people we have today to listen to, uh, but we can also learn from some of the wise teachers uh, of the past. And for doing that, uh, Lewis and Edwards and Aquinas and Luther uh, and uh, the like are a great place to start. So thank you.